All right. Uh, sorry for the delay, uh, having some technical problems over on our end. But good afternoon, good morning, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. And welcome to another episode of Global Crisis, Global Solidarity. My name is Lauren Bellhorn. And as always, I'm joined today by Fida Alzanin. On the first and third of uh, every Wednesday, uh, or the first and third Wednesday of every month, rather, uh, Global Crisis, Global Solidarity welcomes thinkers, scholars, activists, labor leaders, etc., and from a broad spectrum of partners of the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung to, to develop a better understanding of both the local as well as the global dynamics of the current uh, crisis of the capitalist system, and well as, as well as ask what kinds of strategies an internationalist left um, should maybe perhaps take more seriously in response. Today we're going to be talking about the People's Republic of China. Since the coronavirus first emerged in Wuhan earlier this year, the Chinese government's been the subject of both glowing praise as well as harsh criticism from critics on the left and the right and in the East and the West. Nevertheless, eight months into the pandemic, it's basically undeniable that the Chinese approach to containing the coronavirus has been singularly effective as well as the approach to minimizing economic fallout, fallout uh, particularly when compared to the situation in other large countries like Brazil or India, or quite frankly, China's largest geopolitical rival and the wealthiest, most powerful country in the world, the United States. Of course, this all comes at a time of tremendous change in China uh, with the consolidation of the fifth generation of leadership under Premier Xi Jinping, or rather General Secretary Xi Jinping, an escalating war of war words with the United States, what some people are calling a new Cold War, and China's launching of the Belt and Road Initiative, a massive international infrastructural project that has received um, a, a great deal of criticism from the West, but also, one could argue, has provided a lot of countries in the Global South with access to uh, kinds of development programs that previously had been unimaginable. To discuss all of these questions, we're very happy to be joined today by Jan Turovsky, the head of office of the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung's office in Beijing, China. Jan has lived in the People's Republic of China for over a decade and was, in fact, before he took over at the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung, a professor of political science at the Southeast University in Nanjing. If you would like to ask Jan a question or give him a comment of what, how you view the situation in China, feel, feel free to drop a line in the YouTube chat box or in our Facebook chat, and we'll do our best to um, get to all of your questions. Um, eh. Sorry about that little uh, technical issue. I don't think I can hear Jan. That's a little... Uh, Concerning, but anyway, yeah, let's start out with the situation right now. So the coronavirus, like we said, was first detected in December, January, depending on who you believe. There has been criticism uh, that the Chinese government, in fact, failed uh, to immediately inform the world about the public. But as we said in the introduction, after a few weeks, the state reacted incredibly quickly, putting Wuhan on an intense lockdown, but also um, doing a very good job at can containing the pandemic. Now, voices in the West tended to talk about the authoritarian nature of the lockdown, uh, the total state of the lockdown. This could only be possible in a state like China. Um, nevertheless, it seems to have, in fact, been quite popular among the civilian population. How did you experience the pandemic uh, in Beijing, and what is the mood in the country like now? Yeah, hello from Beijing. Thank you for having me. Uh, how did I experience the uh, situation? Well. Um, a couple of days before it became very acute, uh, there was already, of course, in the media talk about uh, some kind of uh, new kind of uh, pneumonia in Wuhan. And uh, um, it was already actually be, being discussed in the media. And, and then it became, then it came, became very, very fast. All of the sudden, you know, it, we are all preparing for going to the Chinese New Year. All of a sudden, you know, the news actually dropped in about this is very, very serious. This is very, very contagious. And uh, at the beginning, no one really knows exactly how contagious and what does it mean. But uh, well, I mean, we are we were planning to go on uh, New Year's vacation, and we actually canceled that. And then a couple of days later, you know, the whole country was essentially in lockdown. Um, I would actually say that uh, um, 
from from the perspective uh, from the retrospe uh, retrospective uh, 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 view i would actually say that we and probably most of the chinese felt that uh, you know the situation were in good hands i mean what i would say is uh, that you always actually have the feeling that uh, if needed the chinese state can be very very effective and efficient and uh, most importantly uh, the state can be mobilize the society. And uh, on the other hand, I would actually say that the Chinese society really wanted the state to mobilize uh, 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 the society. And uh, so I would actually say uh, that everyone went along. We actually had a lot of uh, 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 um, um, a lot of uh, uh, issues we actually have to deal with. So for, you know, uh, uh, all restaurants, all public places have been shut down. For instance, in Beijing, we actually had never a real lockdown, right? I mean, I could go to my office and I always went there to check if everything is okay. But of course the city was completely empty. And if you know Beijing in regular days and you know how crowded the subway, the, uh, the Metro can be, uh, and then you actually go to the metro and you see that it was completely empty, then you actually really got a feeling of the seriousness of uh, the situation. But generally speaking, um, there was never really as much as I experienced it, you know, this kind of discussions like in the West. So what is allowed? How much should the state uh, interfere? Uh, is it is it uh, uh, reasonable to, to ask the people to wear a, a, a mask? Is it reasonable to ask the people if they enter the subway station or if they enter you know, a public building to, to uh, get their temperature measured and so on and so forth? There was never really you know, this kind of uh, discussion. People actually said, yes, this is necessary. This is important right now. And yeah, we have to stay at home for one and a half months. And that's pretty much it. And uh, there was no, uh, no, this kind of public outrage uh, as it was later on actually uh, uh, in the West. Mm. Well, of course, a devil's advocate could respond uh, or could perhaps ask, does the space for that kind of discussion exist in the Chinese public sphere? Well, you have, uh, you have uh, social media, and even if social media is censored and, and being controlled, the censorship and the control cannot be as fast as the social media is actually working, right? And uh, I mean, don't get me wrong. I mean, you know, they, 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 uh, uh, there have been people actually being annoyed, or I, I can even remember that, uh, you know, I actually went to, to a, a public park and you know the guards at the entrance of the park actually ask people to wear a mask and there was an old man who said oh i survived the great leap forward i survived uh, uh, the cultural revolution i mean i don't need to to wear a mask anymore right so i mean of course you know they they were these individual uh, incidents of course but generally speaking no people are actually understand that this is something which needs to be done and people understood that uh, you know there has to be someone in charge of actually leaving that forward and uh, we actually have to say that um, you know in June we actually had another outbreak uh, in Beijing again so it was really you know everything was actually uh, easing easing and uh, 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 calm and then boom we actually had these kind of uh, uh, wholesale uh, fruit market where you know the, the, there was another outbreak and uh, uh, and I really actually at that moment I actually had the feeling uh, that um, um, well that won't be a big deal because now they really know how to handle it right you know they actually have to warn if you actually really actually got it on your call you know contact tracing and you know quarantine and all of this was actually already set in place um that uh, uh, um, that was and that was true you know this this second outbreak was very much under control after two weeks um and i, I really actually think that uh, uh, mobilizing society in that in that way was very very much impressive i mean uh you actually need to have these organizations, you need to have these institutions who actually can do that, right? You know, the neighborhood committee, you know, certain kind of other uh, uh, organizations who actually help out to actually organize these kind of things. 
But um, yeah, I think uh, that uh, overall, and uh, numbers actually uh, prove that, uh, that the, the Chinese, uh, Chinese way was very, very impressive. And uh, if, you, um, if you actually look at uh, you know, the debate uh, in the West, even those who actually are uh, uh, you know, referencing you know, to Asia, they always actually uh, uh, make a reference to, to uh, South Korea and how successful South Korea is. But if you actually you know, uh, look at the death ratio per you know, 100,000 people, I mean, China is even doing or has been done very much better than even South Korea, not even start talking about Europe and America. Yeah. Well, then let's talk a little bit um, about the, the, the Chinese healthcare system. Um, mm. We published an article on our website, rosalux.org slash en, um, just last week, actually, from uh, one of your colleagues there in Beijing about the development of the Chinese healthcare system in recent decades. Mm. Um, I would say, just you know, in, in, perhaps in charactered form, the general narrative of the Chinese healthcare system on the left, at least in the Western world, is under Mao, uh, under Mao Zedong, we had the so-called Iron Rice Bowl, a from birth to death, all-encompassing uh, public provisioning system, which was then abolished under Deng Xiaoping. And it's generally, or the general understanding, I, I would argue, is that now China has essentially a privatized um, Healthcare system. Could you tell us a little bit about um, what what the healthcare system really looks like, and particularly now through the pandemic, um, uh, why did, was it so successful? Mm. Well, I mean, as uh, this article by my colleague uh, Song Wei uh, uh, points out, I mean, the, uh, talking about the Chinese healthcare system, you actually have to understand that it goes through different stages, and uh, it's still. Uh, an ongoing process, uh, uh, particularly um, the, 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 the virus crisis situation actually has enhanced the discussion again, right? How to move forward and how to actually shape uh, uh, the healthcare system. So what you actually have uh, mentioned, you know, in the old uh, uh, pre-reform socialist system, you actually had the uh, uh, so-called uh, uh, Dunway system where, you know, Dunway is the work unit and the work unit, you know, you actually work in, a, you know, public administration and a collective and a company or uh, 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 so on. And, uh, you know, the, 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 your, the, the, the company, the firm, your employer, so to speak, actually provides all the social benefits including healthcare, education, housing. And then you actually have the reform and the reform says, okay, you know, we actually have to shift, you know, what is the main purpose of a company, right? So particularly, you know, those companies who then uh, uh, actually were left to the market, of course, and new founded companies, of course, actually had the main purpose in being, you know, profitable and providing the social, uh, 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 infrastructure is, of course, you now not making a company uh, more profitable. So, and then you actually, from I would actually say, you know, uh, from the late 1980s, uh, uh, 1990s, bis in, uh, uh, up till in the uh, 2000 years, you actually had, you know, the increasing uh, um, uh, delocalization, decentralization of uh, uh, social provisions up till you know the point that there was no social provision at all um, and then um, already in the uh, in the early 2000s uh, it was clear that there has to be a kind of a national healthcare system which is not provided by the companies anymore but you know more like a western style uh, uh, you know universal healthcare system in the 19 uh, in the early 2000s they were probably much more under the uh, the the positive impression what the market actually can do and there was a huge uh, imp uh, um, impact on private uh, healthcare providers and market incentives for uh, uh, healthcare provision. Um, 
And this actually created a lot of problems, right? It created a lot of problems in the uh, 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 in inequality of healthcare, but also in that the system becomes more and more uh, uh, expensive and inefficient. Uh, uh, you know, there was some kind of incentive for doctors to uh, prescribe very, very uh, uh, expensive medication and so on and so forth. So then already in the, the, uh, the late uh, 2000, uh, 2010s, you know, there was a shift back and, you know, you actually had, you know, a kind of, uh, you know, a more mixed system. Uh, you know, you have a, a very heavy uh, 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 regulation by the government. For instance, you actually have price caps on uh, medication or certain uh, 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 procedures are actually regulated. You actually have public hospitals and uh, you actually have uh, private hospitals, which still actually have to follow, you know, the price rules and regulation by the state. And, uh, and now, you know, again, the discussion has shifted even further to a more nationalized uh, uh, system because the, um, the, the uh, uh, coronavirus crisis actually has shown that, uh, you know, the, the, the public infrastructure was very much better suited to deal with this kind of crisis. And uh, you could almost not rely at all on the private uh, healthcare system. So, you know, the, 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 the debate actually has shifted even further uh, towards uh, the um, uh, 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 a kind of public provided healthcare system, which still will have some kind of mixed structures. Uh, but I have to say that, uh, um, I uh, uh, that even, you know, um, um, in regard to who is insured and who is covered by the healthcare system, there actually have been huge uh, improvements over the last years. Uh, I would actually say that approximately 97% of the whole Chinese population actually now has a basic health insurance, right? You know, there's a lot of co-payment and uh, things like that, but, you know, some kind of basic uh, 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 things are actually covered by this uh, uh, insurance, both from the rural, but also by the urban population. Um, good. I'm also interested in knowing how did the pandemic change the uh, healthcare system in China, if mm -hmm. it did, or is there any kind of transformation in the healthcare system? I mean, uh, digitalizing uh, of the healthcare system, integrate integration of big data or artifi artificial intelligence. Is there any kind of mm. initiatives taking place right now in China? Well, I think it's it might be a little bit too early to say right now because I think you know the the, the first of all the, the the virus is still there and they are actually very 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 careful of uh, not actually importing you know and having a new. Uh, 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 outbreak. Um, generally speaking, we can actually say that uh, in regard to, to digitalization of the society, the coronavirus has very much further in, uh, enhanced uh, digitalization and artificial intelligence in the Chinese society. Um, how much it actually has been affected already, you know, the healthcare system, it's kind of difficult to say. But generally speaking in China, you know, there is very, the, the society, the, the decision makers, but also the population is very much more open for using digital tools in actually solving and dealing with certain issues. So uh, if you actually can collect data, if you actually can uh, 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 use uh, uh, artificial intelligence to actually tackle this kind of uh, virus, I think you know, most Chinese probably have less problems with that kind of uh, tools than probably in the Western countries. Mm. You're saying just because people are more used to the notion of surveillance or collectivity, seeing themselves as part of a greater structure? Well, I mean, um, I think that uh, um, in, in, in China, you know, you, you, I think you have to understand that actually China went through a, you know, a very, very radical, uh, fundamental uh, transformation, social, political, economic, uh, cultural transformation in a very, very short time. And um, so I would actually say that, uh, you know, in this high speed, high gear uh, uh, transformation, there might be not that many 
uh, 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 breaks for the society to reflect about, you know, these dangers of digitalization. So generally speaking, you know, in China, there, uh, there is uh, digitalization is being regarded as a very, very helpful tool as something where, you know, uh, uh, the society uh, likes to use and understand uh, has to be uh, used. Recently, of course, there has been also more critical uh, discussions about, uh, you know, uh, digitalization and private, uh, 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 private uh, uh, I, uh, uh, property and identity uh, things. Um, but uh, um, I would say that uh, if you actually speak with Chinese experts in any field, you know, uh, you know, urban studies, healthcare studies, uh, economics, or something like that, all these experts are very, very positive of using, you know, these kind of highly developed uh, digital uh, uh, tools. And I would actually say, if you actually see cities like Beijing or Shanghai, I mean, and I always actually say that. Uh, uh, at, the, at the time of, uh, in 1978, of uh, uh, the opening up policy, uh, the population of Beijing was about uh, roughly 5 million people. Now it's uh, uh, 23 million people. And so you actually have a huge process of urbanization. And uh, of course, you know, all uh, 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 urban planner and uh, 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 policy makers, of course, actually are very, very keen to use these digital uh, uh, tools and devices to actually monitor and steer, you know, the direction of mon uh, 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 digital uh, of urbanization. And if you actually compare cities like uh, uh, in China, for instance, to Brazil or India or something like you, you don't actually have these huge slums. You don't have these favelas or something like that. So. Obviously, you know, using these digital tools might also actually have some kind of upbeat. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. I wanted to ask you about something that really hasn't been in the news in the West very much, but I think is a pretty big news story um, in China, and that's that the uh, the Chinese Communist Party or the Communist Party of China, it's the the correct term, uh, recently announced mm -hmm. that the. 14th five-year plan uh, would be beginning next year and invited the population uh, to contribute their ideas, proposals, etc. Uh, and in fact, has so far received quite an enthusiastic uh, uh, response with hundreds of thousands of people submitting um, their criticisms or ideas, etc. And I wanted, um, I wanted to ask you if you could tell us just a little bit about the five-year plan because it's something that I think between all of the news about Xinjiang and about Hong Kong and about Belt and Road does not really make it into um, the Western news cycle. But also more generally, I mean, you talked about kind of the, the um, overlap between private and public in the healthcare system, but more broadly in the Chinese economy, um, which uh, we would understand has been largely privatized in the last 30 years. What is still being planned uh, in the year 2021? What, what kind of what kind of role does the state have to play, and then how how do the how do public and private sectors interact in that kind of a that kind of a situation? Mm. Well, I think that uh, this is a, um, a very important, but also a very very difficult question. Um, first of all, uh, yeah, we are just in the uh, uh, in the debate about the next five year plan. You know, the the current one, the thirteenth five year plan, is actually ending this year. And uh, so now uh, uh, a huge debate about uh, among intellectuals, but also, as you said, you know, uh, uh, to the wider public um, <clears throat> is uh, debating the, uh, the next five year plan. And um, these five year plans, I think we actually have to be very, very clear that we don't mix it up with, you know, this kind of plans we actually know from the Soviet Union and where you know the the plan was very rigid and very very strict and you know uh, um, not only defined you know who is actually allocating what resources and actually clearly defines you know what should be the outcome of what uh, industry and so on and so forth so um, I would actually say that uh, these uh, five-year plans uh, in China nowadays are very very um, very, very interesting and uh, uh, um, very, very sophisticated. They actually kind of, of course, um, define, you know, in which directions 
you know, the society, the economy should move ahead, right? And uh, how, you know, in this framework, in this, what I actually call, you know, very fundamental goal, you know, the goals, the society, the state is actually setting goals they want to achieve. And then they actually break it down in different segments and, uh, uh, and uh, what they try to achieve and how they actually achieve it. But it's not that rigid and strict like, you know, these plans we actually know from, uh, uh, from, uh, from the Soviet Union is more like giving guidelines, you know, giving, you know, uh, priorities, what needs to be uh, 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 done first. Also using, of course, you know, the whole state apparatus and the state-owned uh, companies in, um, you know, implementing this plan, right? You actually have, you know, uh, tools of directing the economy in a certain direction. And very last but not so least, what, what, actually what having, you know, the that? kind of an open experimental uh, uh, setup. So usually you actually, when you actually have this kind of uh, five-year plans, you actually have goals and in order to achieve these goals, you actually then uh, create so-called uh, so economic so special zones, special economic zones or some, some but uh, uh, special zones who are actually competing with each other and experimenting. And this can be then fused back into you know, the policy making. So you actually have a lot of elements actually coming together. So for instance, when we actually speak about this current, the 13 five-year plan, for instance, actually have set up, you know, all these uh, uh, goals about the social ecological transformation, the so-called socialist eco-civilization. And uh, they actually have reallocated resources. They actually have come up with new guidelines. They actually have come up with uh, new incentives for uh, uh, achieving these goals. And interestingly, all the goals they actually have set up, uh, they want to reach uh, in this uh, 13th uh, 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 five-year plan, they actually have already actually reached in, in regard to ecological transformation. So that's actually very, very impressive. And uh, we can expect that this main direction, uh, main direction of the social ecological transformation will be even further enhanced in the next uh, five-year plan. I have some listening problems. I cannot hear you. Ah, okay. Um, okay, good, good. Mm. Oh. Sounds like this. We might be having a streaming issue. Um, but you can hear me okay? I can hear you, yes. Yeah. Okay, all right. Oh, okay. All right, we're we're back. Sorry about that. Um, must be the rain outside having given us some problems with the internet connection. I wanted to ask you. You said uh, just now. You said that the state has uh, tools to to nudge the economic direction. Um, what do those tools look like, especially outside of special economic zones? Can we imagine the Chinese economy uh, as being still largely state owned? Um, outside of these special economic zones? Or what, what, what specific kind of tools are you talking about? Um, I would actually say you have, um, if you actually really uh, 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 want to understand uh, the Chinese economy, you actually have to, to at least differentiate um, three factors or four factors. You actually have the central government. Then you actually have the local government. Then you have the market, and then you actually have state-owned enterprises. And um, all of these different layers are interacting uh, 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 with each other. But of course, um, and this is something which uh, uh, is very, very crucial, then of course you actually have the uh, 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 Communist Party. And uh, uh, the Communist Party is kind of a conveyor belt of what I'm actually have described before, which is actually decided in the five-year plan, right? So you actually have the, the main targets. You actually say, okay, in these main targets, and this actually should be achieved. We actually want to make, you know, this kind of social ecological transformation. 
And uh, then you actually have uh, the Communist Party with its career pattern. Then you actually have the local governments competing with each other, but all of which are in, uh, uh, you know, in the framework of the plan. And, and then you actually have uh, state-owned companies who sometimes actually can venture in certain areas of the economy, which might or might not be very profitable, but actually are creating you know, a market around them so that then the private market, the private companies actually can follow up you know, the steering done by the government and by the state-owned uh, enterprises. Um, but I really actually have to emphasize that, you know, uh, I think that which is important to understand that you have to get an, a grip of understanding that all of these factors are actually working. They are intertwined, you know, I mean, you cannot understand only state owned companies and enterprises and say, okay, this is, you know, this kind of uh, 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 socialist uh, model, or you have the five-year plan, this is the socialist element, or you actually have uh, 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 the Communist Party and the party cells in each of the, the companies, and this is the element. Or you say the other way around, you say, oh, you actually have uh, private uh, enterprises and you actually have billionaires, therefore it has to be uh, communist. I would actually say that principle, in principle, the basic model of the Chinese uh, of the Chinese development uh, model is that you know the state is defining its goals and therefore uh, it's defining the cycles of uh, uh, in innovation, and that's kind of I think the crucial crucial element. Mm. Okay, let's talk a little bit more about those goals. Um, you already uh, discussed the the. I believe eco-socialist civilization uh, is the is the formal term, but the way that the Chinese state has laid out certain goals in terms of sustainability and environmental protection. Um, another goal that was announced um, in 2017 at the 19th, I believe, it was the 19th uh, Congress of the Chinese Communist Party, um, where of course also term limits for the president and the general secretary were abolished, which tended to be the main story coming out of that Congress for Western media was also the declaration or the stated intention uh, to eliminate extreme poverty by the year 2020 um, uh, in the entire country. So we're getting on September 2020. Um, the Chinese economy has not grown as fast as expected and in fact took quite a hit um, uh, due to the corona pandemic. Is the economy or rather is the society still on track to meet that goal and how can that even be quantified or measured? Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, that's that's actually what you actually say. That's actually, you know, the very, very interesting uh, part when we actually said, you know, setting goals. Uh, it's not only that it's setting goals, but they're also setting timelines when they want to achieve the goals, right? So next year, 2021, you know, that's uh, uh, the year of the 100th birthday of the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, China wants to achieve, you know, the level of a so-called moderate, uh, 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 prosperous society. Uh, by then, you know, the, 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 the uh, uh, absolute poverty should be eradicated. And, uh, um, you know, from, from uh, 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 last year onwards, you actually read in the media that, okay, you know, we have only one year to actually fulfill that uh, uh, goal. It was very, very uh, uh, emphasized by Xi Jinping himself that we actually should uh, uh, put all the efforts to achieve this goal. And even due to the, uh, 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 even in this uh, 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 Corona crisis, it was always actually said, well, even now we're still not giving up on the goal of actually achieving it. So, um, I mean, I actually had uh, 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 spoken to a lot of uh, 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 scholars and friends and, uh, um, and uh, interestingly, they actually said that, you know, you know, what actually has been achieved is very, very impressive. And, uh, uh, you know, they actually went into, you know, particular, you know, the, the, the poverty prob uh, problem is first of all, one of, uh, you know, the rural uh, uh, population and then the rural population and minority uh, 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 regions. And they actually really went into these uh, 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 villages and, you know, they, try to actually build infrastructure, you know, also infrastructure, digital infrastructure for, you know, people actually uh, uh, 
marketing themselves through the internet, uh, um, restoration, uh, educational programs, and so on and so forth. And um, it seems that they actually have uh, uh, achieved that goal. Yeah. So um, uh, this this actually has been uh, very very impressive. And uh, uh, this uh, this uh, this term uh, 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 moderate prosperous society Xiao Kung is actually I, uh, an old uh, Confucian uh, uh, term, which actually, you know, very emphasized, you know, the leveling out of uh, inequalities. So yeah, that's uh, uh, a goal. And again, and this is what I'm trying to say before that you actually have to understand, you know, the different elements together, right? So even this, this uh, uh, approach of eradicating poverty, uh, has to be seen, you know, in connection with the other goal of the social ecological transformation, because now they actually say, okay, you know, how can we actually increase, uh, you know, these ecological awareness and, you know, how we actually can um, uh, create a situation where poverty being eradicated, but within, you know, the ecological uh, uh, framework, right? The, the framework of the ecological uh, transformation. So now they actually say, okay, if you actually want to set up business, then actually make it ecological friendly, something like that. So uh, infrastructure and uh, 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 projects are also actually included in that. So as I said, you actually have in this, uh, 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 since, um, you know, the opening up policies, you have, you have these, uh, 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 for respectively five modernization, right? You know, modernization of the society, modernization of the economy, uh, military, and so on and so forth. And since the uh, 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 18th party convention, even uh, uh, modernization of the ecology. So this is what they actually call the five in one. You actually have five modernization, which of course in uh, directing in one modernization of China, right? So. Uh, as I said, you actually have to understand these different levels and uh, uh, interaction and inter, uh, interaction of these different approaches. Mm. Well, on the topic of different levels, um, obviously the Communist Party of China, uh, the ruling party of China for over 70 years, keeps coming up in, in, in the answers you're giving. But I'd like to understand a little bit more the... Um, well, how does how how does the does the party exercise its authority? I mean, if we if you if you watch the news in the West, if you watch documentaries about China, um, even from uh, you know public broadcasting, more left liberal broadcasting, the story I would say over the last five to six years has been China has a crucial problem: declining growth rates. That the workshop of the world model uh, is increasingly ineffective in growing the Chinese economy. And you have a, a spread of, of, of dissidents, uh, whether it be in Western China or in Hong Kong. And the narrative tends to be, uh, in order to reassert control over a increasingly uh, untenable situation, the Chinese party has re-centralized authority, has reasserted the role of what is called the core leadership um, around President Xi Jinping in, as a way to, um, well, to, to clamp down a society as real turbulence um, begins to set in. How do you, or you've been in China for quite a long time, you've experienced multiple governments, uh, to what extent does this story reflect your experiences? And to what extent does this reflect the role of the party in public life as you've, as you've experienced it? Well, I mean, um, I, I, first of all, I would actually say that uh, you cannot understand China if you don't even try to understand the Chinese Communist Party. Um, the Chinese Communist Party actually has um, modernized and reformed itself over the last 40 years tremendously. And uh, uh, you actually have to understand that. I would actually say that uh, the, 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 the critique you actually have mentioned, uh, uh, um, particularly in the West, um, I, I would actually say you know, that uh, uh, um, some of them um, are valid and uh, uh, worth discussing, but uh, um, I would say a little bit under complex. And others are actually, you know, I would say Eurocentric and uh, uh, just under, you know, don't understand or not even trying to understand China out of its own logic. 
So coming now, making it actually concrete. Uh, I, I think that uh, 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 over the last 30 years, there have been plenty uh, 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 polls about uh, the support of the Chinese government, respectively the Communist Party. And uh, uh, the overall, uh, uh, I mean, you know, not that all uh, 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 polls actually show uh, a very, very clear support of the political system. But even, you know, the support in very, very high numbers. I mean, you know, the support for the government over the last 30 years was always above 80%. Uh, and even uh, uh, just recently, there, I think there was, um, uh, I think it was just two or three weeks ago, you know, a study in Harvard, which actually now says it's about uh, uh, 95%. So the support for the government is actually uh, 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 um, relatively high. And we actually have to understand, you know, why is that the case? We also actually have to understand uh, that when we actually talk about China and this enormous dynamic, the economic uh, uh, dynamic over the last 40 years, this cannot just happen if you actually have this, you know, authoritarian top-down communication. What I'm actually just uh, uh, said that there, you know, if we talk about this five year plan, if we talk about some kind of, uh, you know, social or, you know, some kind of understanding of what are the, uh, the uh, uh, developmental goals, what do we actually as a society actually want to achieve, there has to be some kind of uh, 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 a basic consensus. And you cannot reach this consensus if there is no di public discourse. There is public discourse in China. I think in, in some regard, even a more vivid and uh, interesting discourse uh, uh, than in the West. And in other fields, it's completely shut down, of course. Yeah, I mean, there are uh, 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 taboos. You know, the leadership uh, of the uh, Communist Party is a taboo. Uh, the integ uh, 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 integrity of the country in its borders is uh, a taboo. You cannot actually uh, uh, discuss it. But on the other hand, uh, we actually have a more broad uh, 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 discussion about, uh, you know, how to achieve what kind of goals than, for instance, in the West, which I think is completely narrowed down their debate on a okay, very, uh, very, very fun, uh, uh, basic principles. I would even go a step further. I think that uh, uh, China um, raises certain certain questions for 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 the West. Uh, these questions have been there before, but you know, China actually uh, uh, poses this question even more urgently. Um, and, and these questions are, of course, you know, how do we actually define freedom? How do we actually define, you know, the, the relation between the individual and the, uh, the society? And um, so I don't think that there is, there are, you know, in, in, in modern society, there are actually fundamental contradictions. There are fundamental contradictions in the West and there are fundamental contradictions uh, in China. And the, 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 the interesting question is how do, or what are the strategies of these different societies to deal with this contradiction? So uh, when, uh, 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 when the West actually posing itself as actually saying, okay, we are free of any kind of contradictions, this liberal model of uh, democracy is free of any contradiction is as wrong as actually saying that, uh, you know, China is a contradiction free socialist paradise, right? So I really actually think that this, uh, uh, that discussing China from that kind of position is interesting because it actually reflects back very, very fundamental question we in the West also actually have to discuss. Well, maybe that can be uh, the question that we wrap up on. I know you've already been talking to us for a while and it's pretty late over there, but one of the things that your office does, the Rosa Luxemburg office in Beijing, is facilitate uh, a number of dialogues between Chinese and Western scholars on a number of questions concerning Marxist theory, but also social ecological transformation. Um, yeah, a number, a number of key topics for any left-wing thinkers or actors um, today. At the same time, we have uh, most certainly on the geopolitical level a uh, 
rising what is referred to as a new Cold War between China and the West, but also, I think, uh, within the political left. There's not actually that much engagement with what's coming from China. And also, uh, well, I don't know if it's the other way around as well, to what extent Western debates and Western criticisms um, influence the Chinese debate. But as someone who uh, has spent years now trying to facilitate these, uh, these dialogues, do you see much potential for a real exchange between the Western and Chinese lefts? And if yes, where do you think, what kind of questions do you think that we could structure that around? Well, first of all, I really actually think that uh, there's uh, one main difference. Uh, uh, you actually just mentioned it. You know, the West does not really know much about China. I mean, uh, I think, you know, whenever when time I'm actually talking about China, everyone has an opinion, but uh, not many people actually know much about China. Um, so uh, there is, of course, a huge difference, because if you actually speak to Chinese scholars, they are very, very well informed about the Western discourses and the left Western discourses. Uh, we just today, we actually had uh, a workshop talking about critical theory, how we actually can apply critical theory to, to China, to a global situation. And uh, what are the specific uh, uh, features of the Chinese dis uh, discussion about a critical reflection about modernity? And I actually can tell you that they know the Western discourse very well. And uh, this is, of course, you know, this kind of imbalance that, you know, the West does not really, and I would actually say, don't really care. We actually have, uh, you know, pretty much, you know, a kind of uh, um, stereotype uh, framework of how we actually see China and how we actually analyze China in that way. And everything which actually goes beyond that um, probably does not actually raise uh, 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 interest and and of course I really do think that we are in a global situation today that we cannot, in particular in the left, we cannot uh, 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 cannot not talk about China. We cannot not talk about Chinese socialism. We actually have to have an uh, uh, idea about it. But the interesting thing, if I actually can uh, 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 say it in the end, I mean, the interesting thing when am I actually uh, talking about uh, uh, China uh, on the left, it's, you know, that everyone actually is uh, uh, telling me that, but we, we need to criticize China. I mean, we need to have the right to criticize China. And I'm always saying, of course, you can criticize China, but before criticizing China, maybe you should be should know and educate you a little bit more about what's going on in China. What are the problems in China? How they actually dealing with the problems? What are the fric uh, the frictions and the the, the discussions and the the, the 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 search process to solve problems? Um, because they could be very very insightful for the Western debate as well. I'm not saying that this is a, a blueprint for the Western discussion. Of course not. But there could be exchange and uh, 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 you know uh, interesting debates, and maybe some ideas can be in incorporated in our our discourse as well. Well, thanks again, Jan, for taking your time. Um, thanks to everyone who tuned in. Uh, we're actually going to be taking a break uh, in, the, in, the, in for the rest of the month because the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung is in fact moving to a new office hopefully where the internet connection is a bit more reliable than it is here, uh, so we don't continue to have these, these problems that we've had the last few weeks. But we'll be back on October 7th with uh, David Broder. He is the Europe editor for Jacobin Magazine uh, and the author of a new book on the rise of the populist right in Italy, First They Took Rome. We'll be talking to him about the legacy of 20th century socialism and the 20th century communist movement and to what extent it has any relevance for rebuilding a socialist left in the 21st century. My name is Lauren Bellhorn. As always, I was joined by Fida Alzanin. Uh, if you'd like to follow us on Twitter, you can find us at uh, twitter.com slash rosalux underscore uh, global, or global rather. And if you'd like to make suggestions for future topics or guests, uh, just drop us a DM or write us with the hashtag global solidarity. Thanks a lot, and see you in a month.